The planet Earth is being visited by extraterrestrial travelers from a group of suns called the Pleiades, and it's time you knew about it. Hello, I'm Jay Randolph Winters, and the past seven, eight years I've been disseminating information about the most well-documented UFO case ever on record. I'm talking about the case of Mr. Edward Albert Meyer. You see, in 1975, Mr. Meyer began having contacts with extraterrestrial travelers from the star system we call the Pleiades. Now, these contacts are still continuing today. And we've always wondered, are extraterrestrial travelers coming here? And if they did, would they land on the White House lawn? Would they visit you and I? How would it happen? Or has it already happened? Well, it has. And they've been visiting Mr. Meyer for many years. What we're going to talk about today is his conversations with those travelers. You see, he's been allowed to go on board ship with them, travel to other galaxies. He's taken over a thousand beautiful, clear pictures. There have been metal samples, landing tracks, biological samples, and a lot of other evidences. But probably most important to you and I are the conversations. You see, he's been able to talk to them now for years and ask them questions about us. Where are we from? Where are we going? Who are we? Man's always been puzzled by his past. We seem to have been left alone here a little bit on Earth with no great contact with our past. So today we're going to discuss that and I'm going to get you a little bit more familiar with our connection with the Pleiadians. For a long time we've had an urge to contact someone who sincerely wants to be helpful in our mission. Here and there we open such contacts with inhabitants of different worlds but only when they have developed enough to become rational thinking beings. Then we prepare them for the thought that they are not the only rational thinking beings in the universe. If extraterrestrials are going to visit us, who are they going to pick to talk to? Now we hear the expression a lot about landing on the White House lawn, but is that really a good idea? Are we all ready for that? Is the world ready to suddenly be confronted with irrefutable proof that there are extraterrestrials out there? Or would they perhaps just choose one or two of us or a small group of us to pass on their message? Well, it seems in this particular instance they've chosen just one man. Billy's contacts with the Pleiadians began when he was only five. They were telepathic at first, but later on at the age of seven he made his decision to go on with the mission. Eleven years of telepathic transmissions from a Pleiadian man named Sfath. At the age of 16, however, his teaching was taken over by an extraterrestrial named Ascot. These pictures, taken in India, are of Ascot, her crew, and her ships. As Billy started studying about man and raising his consciousness to a point that he would be able to have his mission scheduled for later on in life. And then it began. January 1975, Henwell, Switzerland. At approximately 6 a.m. in the morning, Edward Albert Meyer, better known as Billy, woke up on his farm to get to work as usual. Unbeknown to him, though, in the Pleiades, the system of Tegeta, on a small planet called Ira, a lady named Sinyasi was preparing to begin her seven-hour trip to the planet Earth. She'd been preparing for 10 years, studying Billy's mind, his emotions, and working with other people in the Pleiadian race about what to tell us, what to teach us, how to gently awaken us to the fact that we are not alone. As her ship came into our solar system that day, she sent a telepathic message to Billy. Billy received this. He felt the familiar cooling spot on his forehead, paid attention to the message, hopped on his moped, took his camera with him, and rode out to a secluded area in the forest that he was being led to. Now on that day, this may be similar to what Simyasi saw as she approached Earth to begin a long-awaited and anticipated meeting with Billy Meyer. She'd even learned his language to have these meetings. Billy was waiting patiently, waiting by the trees, watching for something to appear. And then it happened. A silver ship came in very quietly. At first, he wasn't sure if the ship would stay, it would land, or what was going to happen. So he snapped a couple of pictures just in case it darted away. He was a little surprised, you see, because he wasn't expecting these contacts to happen for another year. Well, the ship moved to the left, went around behind the trees, and appeared again, so he snapped a couple of more pictures. By the way, all the pictures that Billy has taken are with an Olympus 35 millimeter camera that has a little wheel on the back to advance the film. You see, Billy only has one arm. His left arm, unfortunately, was severed in a bus accident years earlier. 
Billy wasn't anxious or scared. As a matter of fact, he knew the Pleiadians were human just like us. He already knew that their forefathers were our forefathers, and he was expecting to have meaningful conversations with these people because they did bring peace and love to us. Billy walked towards the ship as it gently sat down on the meadow, but he was arrested, he said, by unseen force. He couldn't seem to get any closer, so he just waited, and then a lady from the stars stepped out. As Billy sat under the tree that day, talking with Sim Yossi very casually, he couldn't help but notice just 100 meters away the gleaming starship that she had just arrived in. He had to ask, how does that thing work and how long did it take you to get here? Well, Sim Yossi replied, we call them beam ships. And that name comes from a long time ago in their history when the first propulsion system that they came upon to move among the stars was a light emitting device and the name beam ship stuck because it worked on a principle of light transmission. They no longer use that, she says, but the name is always stuck. They prefer the round shape. It's comfortable for one thing. The old drive systems needed that shape, so they had a different body surface to facilitate the magnetic drive. They no longer do, by the way. But she told him it just took seven hours to get here, but she thought that was a long time to have to travel in a ship. That might not seem too long to us. She had left ERA and flown here and got here that quickly. How can that be? Now that's 500 light years away. Now by our technology, that would be impossible at this moment. Our best rockets are moving 30, 40,000 miles per hour. The speed of light is dramatically faster than that, closer to 700 million miles per hour. So how is it possible? You see, what they've done, she explained, is the ships speed up to approximately the speed of light. At that point, the mass-speed correlation, in other words, the energy of the universe pressing in on the ship, is tremendous. The ships are protected by an energy screen that holds that off. Just at the right moment, they lower those screens, and all that energy is forced in against the ship. Well, they use that energy in kind of a compression fashion to do something really unique. They convert the ship and all matter involved with it into thought. They call it spiritual energy. We would just think of it as thought. It no longer exists in the material frame. What that allows them to do is step outside of time into null time and then move that thought at a much higher speed to its destination. Then the ship and everything that's in it rematerializes again in its material form, allowing them to traverse these vast distances literally at the speed of a thought. You see, it took three and a half hours when she left ERA to speed up to the speed they were going to make this conversion. Then the jump just took a part second. There's not even any realization of it. Then it took about three and a half hours to slow down again.